Great. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Karina Rackett, and I'm the um, executive director at BIC and your host for this, the fifth in our new series um, of uh, BIC Brunches, the Thema Sessions. This series of Thema Sessions is brought to you in collaboration with Editeur, the organisation that manages and develops the Thema Standard, which many of you, I'm sure, will be, will be familiar with. <clears throat> Today's session will be exploring the use of Thema for academic titles. So, why the Thema series of branches? Um, well, as many of you will hopefully already be aware, um, at the end of February last year, so February 22, we announced that the um, BIC Standard Subject Category Scheme, or BIC Codes, as, as you'll probably more commonly know them, <clears throat> will be made obsolete by February 2024. Um, and so this series of theme sessions is, is going to run from now until at least February 24 um, to help support the industry with that transition. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we've currently got the uh, another session lined up uh, later this month, um, exploring the topics, the topic of, uh, of comics and manga, um, which is set to be a very interesting session. We had a little uh, sort of rehearsal practice yesterday so so do watch out for that um and we'll be sort of inviting people to to sign up for that session later or you can do that now if you want um <clears throat> the link is there on the screen so you can sign up to any of our training or events um including the comics and manga brunch um via the link on the screen there um there'll also be a new press release coming out in february this year um, so please also watch out for that. <clears throat> it will include links to a set of FAQs, which some of you may find helpful uh, in your implementation considerations as you start moving on over to, to using Thema. If you've signed up to our mailing lists, you'll get that press release automatically. Um, and the link to, to sign up to that mailing list will come further on um, in, in, in subsequent slides. <clears throat> um, as you can see on the screen, back in, just to give you an idea of the, of the brunches on Thema that we've already done, um, we've done several now, we've done four, this is the fifth one, sixth one to come. <clears throat> you can find all the links to the video recordings on your screen there. So a variety of topics, so we've looked at adult fiction, had a guided tour through Thema 1.5, we've looked at diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, children's, teenage and educational, and then um, general or adult non-fiction, trade non-fiction. <clears throat> All those links go to YouTube. That's our YouTube channel. You don't have to be a member um, to go in, and you don't. I don't even think you need to subscribe to, to YouTube. You can you can just go in, use those links, and have a look. <clears throat> the sessions that we're planning um, from sort of February onwards this year won't necessarily look at particular topics or subject categories. These will focus more on the sort of the nuts and bolts, the how to how to implement the Thema, types of questions to to how to talk to your systems um, providers, your trading partners, types of questions to ask, et cetera. All really just to, to help you um, in practical terms um, move towards implementing this scheme. <clears throat> so do feel free to tweet about the event at any time. The hashtag there is, is on your screen, um, Big Brunch. Um, and just some general housekeeping before we get started. So um, there'll be plenty of opportunity for uh, questions later on. And um, please use the question box that you, sh you should have a little toolbar on your screens on this platform. You should see a question box. Please do put your question in there. Um, <clears throat> and we can ask, the organi we can ask um, those questions of the speakers uh, later on in the session. If you've got a question for a particular person, just, just say who you want the question directed to. It's quite straightforward. The event's been recorded um, so that we can use it in our marketing and, as I've already said, to, to enable those people that may not have been able to make it today um, to watch the recording later on. <clears throat> you can also have it as a, you know, a resource to go back to and refer to later. And uh, finally, a gentle reminder that BIC is a neutral uh, membership organisation and as such we politely ask that all attendees and all speakers strictly avoid any comments, conversations or questions that might be considered commercially sensitive or anti-competitive. <clears throat> we'll be sharing the slides um, from today's session with you all later on, um, so don't worry about 
scribbling down um, the uh, the links. They're quite they're quite long, um, so you'll have all of this information um, after the session later on, probably next week, sometime next week. <clears throat> Eventually, we'll put the slides and the record and the link to the recording on our website. Um, I say eventually because, as some of you may know, our website is currently under construction. Um, so do bear with us while, while we get that ready. Um, we should be launching that uh, a beta version of our new website at the end of February. So go and have a look um, then if you if you would prefer to do it that way. <clears throat> okay. So enough housekeeping. Here's the agenda. For today, the running order. So um, I'll hand over to Chris Sainer from Editor in a minute, um, who's going to talk generally about uh, Thema and then do a bit of a deeper dive, or quite a deep dive actually, um, into academic content. And then I'll, we'll be hearing from Fiona, Fiona Green at Bloomsbury Academic and Professional. Um, and she's going to talk to us about how um, her division uh, generally at Bloomsbury, but more specifically her division, how they've implemented um, Thema. <clears throat> Once presentations have been given, it's over to you, um, our attendees for a Q&A session. Don't be shy, we, you won't be identified um, at all in the recording. They will, I won't reveal any names or anything like that. I literally just ask the question, so, so don't worry, feel free. Make the most of, of, of today's session to, to ask as many questions as you like. Um, and then we'll just have a quick wrap up. We should be finished by, by 1.30, all being well. So before we get started, um, who are we? Who's BIC? <clears throat> what do we do? Well, many of you, um, I suspect, will already be quite familiar with, with what we do. So please bear with me. Um, but for the benefit of those who aren't, uh, BIC is a UK-based, not-for-profit members organisation at the heart of the book industry, creating standards, best practices and resources, forming part of the DNA of your supply chains. We help your organisation become more efficient, save money, become less wasteful and ultimately, hopefully, greener. We hold a unique position of trust and facilitate UK and international industry-wide collaboration to reach agreement on dependable standards and best practice in the supply chain. We do this in a variety of ways, including running five strategic committees, focusing on metadata, libraries, physical, digital and green supply chains. We offer training events and workshops, and execute supply chain related projects for and on behalf of our membership, but also the, the wider industry. We operate three industry recognised accreditation schemes as well. Um, and again, I would say go to our website to find out more, but you won't be able to. Um, so if you would like more information about anything I've just mentioned or generally or, or specifically about BIC, please feel free to email me um, and, uh, and, and we can carry on the conversation there. <clears throat> So back to the purpose of today's session. As I've already um, alluded to, today's speakers will share expert hints and tips on how to go about implementing Thema from scratch. We'll hear how participation in the BIC UK National Thema Group, amongst other things, was helpful for Bloomsbury in this regard. We'll hear about um, how Thema can be used by publishers and booksellers to help with greater, easier discoverability and promotion. Um, of academic non-fiction books, including how to use qualifiers and national extensions to really help signpost the reader <clears throat> and sell more books. Um, and finally, we'll also hear about the importance of consistent cross-team training and ongoing engagement with the standard. So, there's a lot to cover today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Chris Sainor standards editor at editor um, after a brief introduction to thema chris will be giving advice via uh, detailed work examples um, on uh, how, to, how to best use thema with, with academic titles and how to classify how to classify them and different ways of, of approaching classification of, of, of that content he's going to look at qualifiers national extensions um, and the importance of intended audience and treatments so over to you Chris let me just share make you presenter just bear with me there we go okay 
we should have that. <clears throat> <clears throat> nope, sorry, wrong window. Apologies, am I right? There we go. There we go. Perfect. <clears throat> I'll hand over to you now, Chris, so I'm going to disappear. Thank you, Karina. Um, thank you, everyone, and welcome to this um, fifth talk in the. Oh, sorry. Stopped, sorry. <clears throat> Little technical hitch there. Technical hitch. We can talk amongst ourselves <clears throat> while we do that. Oh, there <clears throat> we are. Excellent. The Quite technical okay. hitch was me hitting the wrong button <clears throat> and escaping <laughs> everything. Um, so thank you and welcome. So today we're going to be looking at FEMA in the context of academic, academic titles. Um, so <clears throat> to start with, Let's uh, just remind ourselves, for those of you who've not attended one of these sessions before, what is Thema? So Thema is um, an international multilingual book subject classification scheme. So it's designed to meet the needs of the whole of the book industry. So publishers, retailers, and trade intermediaries, and in all sectors of this global book business. So you could use it for physical products or digital products. You can use it for audio. It can be made, it can be used by in-person retailers or online retailers. It can be used for domestic, purely domestic purposes, or it can be used on an international trade. It can be used by all sectors of the publishing industry, children's, educational, trade, and in the context of today, academic publishing. And the whole point of Thema is it's there to help improve the discoverability, the merchandising, and potential sales of books. It's created and it's maintained by the people who use it. So it's not, it is something that is relevant to the whole industry. And to remind ourselves also of the structure of Thema. So Thema is made up of about 3,000 core subject categories. So those are the uh, subjects like history, science, etc. Those are, there are 20 main uh, hierarchies um, and they have a varying le level of detail. Alongside that, there are about 1,000 shared qualifiers in six categories. Um, those qualifiers are there to be used along with the subject categories. And then we have about 4,000 national extension qualifiers. Uh, these are mostly in place qualifiers. So a lot of detail has been added to the places, plus in the educational section, where we have a lot of national educational qualifiers for different educational schemes. And each of those subject categories and qualifiers has a language independent code, plus a heading, and quite often, a note. Those codes are is what is used for communicating the information from machine to machine, and the headings and the notes can be in multiple languages. <clears throat> so just to give you an illustration, um, this is a snippet of Onyx, and this is about this is how you would send information about subjects. And you notice I have three thema codes here, VX. HF, as said, RGBL. And as Onyx is designed for machine to machine communication, all you need is the code. You can, of course, put in the subject headings in the different languages, that's still valid Onyx, but for machine to machine, all you need is the code. And that's very useful in the academic sector because um, the, the person who is adding the qualifier codes will be, the, the subject codes will be looking at an interface in their own language looking at text, the people who receive it can view the, the subject in their own language because that code uh, will correspond to the relevant translation. And as in academic markets, librarians, uh, university people sometimes are looking for uh, works on a subject, but they don't necessarily speak the language. It's a good way of communicating 
concepts. And of course, within Onyx, you will designate one subject as being your main subject. Main subject is, look, if you're only gonna use one subject, use this one. If you're only gonna put it on one bookshelf, this is the bookshelf you need to put it on. So main subject, an incredibly important concept when exchanging metadata. And if we look at those three codes, these are, this is the book in its original Japanese plus an English language translation and a German language translation. So we've got the same codes, but each of those codes can be shown in its own language. <clears throat> and each of those codes can stand on its own as a, as a subject code or can be used together. And at the moment, just as a reminder, there are 26 uh, official language versions of Thema. Now, these are either full translations of all the headings and notes or just translations of the headings or partial translations. And all of these are available on the browser version of Thema. And also as a reminder, we have six general rules of Thema classification. Now, these are guidelines. There's no Thema police will come and tell you you've broken one of these rules, but they're there to help people when they're deciding how to use Thema codes. Now, the first one is you need to always designate one subject code as being the main one. However you communicate your Thema codes, if you use Onyx, if you send them in a spreadsheet, if you're choosing them in an interface, you need to be able to designate one of them as being the primary one if you're going to use more than one subject code. It's very important. You need to always think about classifying your titles as precisely as applicable. This is a hierarchical scheme. You have very, you have broader codes and you have more precise codes. You do not have to choose the most precise code. Choose the most relevant code. Top, some works are about broader topics. Use those. You also do not have to choose, add, so for example, if you choose something from the M section, the medical section, you do not need to send M as a code if you're choosing one of the M codes because M is part of that structure. Always assign as many categories as required within reason, bearing in mind this is a subject classification scheme, not a list of keywords. So quite often one or two codes are enough. Four is a good average. If you're finding yourself adding six or more, subject codes, you're probably getting to the top end of what you should be adding. So that's a good guideline. Qualifiers, add those whenever they, they are required. And same rules apply to qualifiers as they do subject categories. Look at the scope notes, especially when you're first starting to use particular subject codes, have a look at the notes. The notes might give you guidance about other things that can go there or instructions for use with different codes. And finally, always consider the context, the context of your work, the title and the context of the codes, because some codes, for example, for academic titles, you, if you choose that code, it won't make sense for an academic title because the code gives an implication it's for children, for example. So <clears throat> I thought might be good in the context of academic to think about how we uh, go about looking at whether we add new codes to to thema so thema is a hierarchy of concepts and sometimes people will say i can't express that concept using existing thema codes so what we then think about is <clears throat> more can we express that concept is there a way of expressing that with an existing code or with an existing combination of codes and perhaps that's not clear enough so do we need to expand that note um, so if we say, look, it, it's actually covered by this code, but we just need to make it clearer. Or maybe this is such a big concept, it does need its own subject code or qualifier. So whichever we decide seems to be the best path, either adding it to a note or proposing a new subject code, they get added into the proposals. Next time there's a revision that goes out to the review process. And then if it's accepted, so for example, if we add it in as a new subject code or qualifier, uh, we'll look for the best place in the hierarchy to add that concept, and we will come up with a heading and clarification. Now, that concept we will create, we will write the heading and note in English. When the Germans do their translations, they will translate the concept. So it may not be an exact translation of the words, 
but the German, the concept will be expressed in the best way that it can be expressed in German. English is only special in Thema in the sense that you know that every uh, code is going to have a heading and a note in English, but English is just the first amongst equals because quite a lot of the concepts come from another language because it is a global scheme. Let's look at some examples. So in the academic world, <clears throat> in universities, books are often grouped together in, in areas of study, studies, and <clears throat> they, a classic example are regional studies. These may be geographical or cultural regions. So French studies, Latin American studies, African studies are three examples. So we have codes within the G section. Um, there's a whole set of GT codes that are really meant for interdisciplinary uh, studies. And we have this one, regional and international studies, which can be used in combination with other subject codes, plus qualifiers. Now they may be qualifiers for place, or there may be qualifiers for language, or they may be both. So if the subject is about the places, or if the subject is more about the languages, or both. So for example, French studies. <clears throat> We're going to use the GTM code. We may use another subject code as well that may be relevant if it's looking at literature, if it's looking at French philosophy, if it's looking at something else, but we can use the uh, GTM code. And along with that, we're going to use the qualifiers. So if our French studies is about France, things that go on in France and the French language, we can use a place qualifier for France and a language qualifier for French. If our French studies is more about uh, the whole French speaking world, we have a sub, uh, place qualifier for the Francophonie. So that's all the places that speak French. If our Latin American studies is just about place, we're going to use the place qualifier. We have a place qualifier, a broad place qualifier for the whole of Latin America. For our African studies, we're going to use the GTM subject code plus the Africa place qualifier. And as I said, you can use other relevant subject codes as well. Let's take another example. Sociology. Sociology is a broad academic subject with many different branches and concepts. I've used extracts from the Wikipedia page purely because it was a good illustration of the diversity of what can come under sociology. Um, there are different branches, different concepts um, within sociology, and you may be publishing or classifying books on multiple uh, areas of this. So how do you do it? Thema is not, um, of the Library of Congress classification. It's not a, a, an academic library classification. There aren't details for every single possible subject. You have to, to, to make use of what's there. So let's take one subject. Let's take the sociology of immigration. So I've got two books. I need to classify their back the sociology of immigration. OK, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look on the Thema browser. I'm going to look up sociology of immigration. That will give me no results. There isn't a subject category that is called sociology of immigration. So what do I do? Well, I'm going to look up immigration next. And that does return some results. That gives me five codes. So immediately looking at the five suggestions, there are two I will eliminate straight away because F X Q is fiction. This, these are these are academic uh, works. These are not works of fiction. Why um, code if this is not a children's book? So I eliminate that. The qualifier mm, may be relevant depending on the approach of the thing. I'm left with three possible codes, two from the social sciences area that start with J and one from the law. These two books, let's say these two books don't really do with the law section. So I'm going to use one of the J. I'm probably going to go for J E F H. But I also want to make it clear that this is a sociology book. So I'm going to look up sociology and the Thema browser. I see there's a sociology section, plus it comes up with other things. It's definitely going to be in with that, in that JH area that I'm going to want something. So I might have a look at the JHB, see what else is there. But when it comes down to it, I think the most important thing is to use these subject codes. So I'm going to send JBFH migration, immigration, and emigration. I'm going to say that's my main subject because that is what these are mostly about. 
if you're only going to put it in one place, I'd quite, I think it will be better in the immigration area. I have a code to set sociology, and I also have added a qualifier because it's about the sociology of immigration in the United States of America. So what I've done here, I've given people the um, options. So you can either put it in your, say you're a small bookseller or a small library, you could just put it in the sociology section or maybe just in the immigration section. Maybe if you have a, a section, if you're more sophisticated, you have a section on interest in the United States, you could put it in the US section. I've also got three codes that I could put together. So I could put them together to create the sociology of immigration. So by using the two subject codes and the qualifiers, I'm giving various options. Let's take another book. So this <clears throat> is a collection of translated po poems, uh, plays, and essays uh, by the 17th century Mexican writer. Now, these may go in an academic section called Hispanic Studies or Hispanic Literature because they were written in the Spanish language originally. She was from Mexico, so maybe they'd go in a Latin American studies area or a Latin American literature. Maybe they go in Mexican poetry or Mexican literature because she is from Mexico. So we have subject codes that we're going to use to say it's about poetry, it's about it, uh, plays and literary essays. But Thema is a global scheme. <clears throat> There's no such thing as Spanish literature because well, if you're using this in Spain or in a Spanish-speaking country, literature, all your literature is Spanish. And also, what do you have to decide what do you mean by Spanish literature? Do you mean the language? Now, if it's the language, you're going to get that information from elsewhere. So, for example, in your metadata, you're going to say this book was originally translated from Spanish. And you can even say it was translated from the Me Spanish from Mexico. So, there you've got the information that it was translated from Spanish. So if your academic studies are about the language, it's there. If your academic study is more linked to place, where the original author is from or associated with, again, you can find that in other metadata. For example, in Onyx, in the contributor area of Onyx, you have the place code, um, Mexico. So I can put this in the relevant section. You'll also notice in this um, uh, bit of Onyx, I have an ISNI. Uh, international standard name identifier. So that's a unique identifier associated with this particular author. And I'm going to uh, transfer that to another element of Onyx. It's called name as subject. So I'm linking across. It's another way of linking um, if, uh, particular titles. So the ISNI is a way of linking from a book by an author to a book about an author. You also notice in the theme of, uh, codes I've chosen for this is the book about so Juana, um, so I have my subject, but I'm also, in this case, I am using place qualifiers because it's about um, somebody who lives in Mexico. It's a subject. So we've got Mexico. We've also got an historical place qualifier because in the 17th century, Mexico was still part of the Spanish Empire. So we can use an historical place qualifier as well. Now, <clears throat> in academic publications, there are an awful lot of specialities. And it may be unclear to those who do not know what the concept of this work is. So for example, I'm, I am not sure what an activist cognition is. So it raises the question, who should decide and choose the theme of subject quotes and the qualifiers to go with a particular work? Well, you need to ask yourself, who knows the content of the work best? Who, who's got, who understands what this work is about? So who will therefore choose the right subject codes? And also when you're looking at classification, who is this information for? Who are you classifying for? Okay. Now, as somebody who doesn't really know what this is, I looked at our FEMA codes and I see we have a, a philosophy code, African philosophy. And we have a, an interdisciplinary code on cognitive studies. So my suggestion would be to use those two and then I'd have to choose one of those to be my main subject. <clears throat> Within uh, subject schemes, and this applies to Thema as well as many others, there's often, even though it's a subject classification scheme, there is a notion of audience and a notion of treatment. So for example, within Thema, we have the Y section. The Y section is where we deal with children, teens, uh, and educational material. 
but also within the adult codes, we have some codes that are obviously more suited for a general trade, others that are more professional, and others that are more for the academic area. So this should be taken into consideration when you're classifying your academic titles. So let's take these two titles, both of them about birds, but both of them taking a completely different approach and obviously aimed at a different audience. So we have two very good subject codes for these. One, PSDJ, is very much more scientific, WNCB, bird watching, very much more aimed at general public. So the bird watchers pocket guide would get a WNCB code and it would tell you what it's about, but there's also a no notion within that that it's more broadly general public. Whereas I'm going to use the PSVJ zoology one, this is scientific approach to this book. So within those two codes, there's a notion of treatment and of audience. Now this doesn't apply to all FEMA codes. Let's take history. For those of you who saw the previous training, or you remember I used this title and this slide in that one, because the history codes in themselves do not give any uh, clear indication of <clears throat> it's aimed at an academic audience or it's aimed at a broad general audience. That is sent in other metadata. Again, I've used an extract of Onyx, audience code value, zero one, that means it's general trade. But if I change that, because this title could well be an academic title, so I change that to zero six, that's implying that this is for an uh, academic audience. So <clears throat> some codes have a notion of audience and treatment because of the very nature of their subject. Others, are you need other metadata to clarify that. And that um, 06 will link me to other titles that have, take a far more academic approach to archaeology of Roman Britain. <clears throat> now, that notion of treatment, we do give clear indications. So in the basic instruction guides for um, Thema, which is available on the editor website, normally, um, <clears throat> you, there's um, a clear part in each uh, introduction to each subject code. There's a, a, um, a clear indication of treatment. So is this mostly professional? Is this mostly general public? Is this everything? So it's very clearly indicated on that. It's a good, it's a good thing to, to, to look at initially. And also on the browser version, on the notes that are on the top level codes, we also include this information. I mean, the guidelines. Along with the subject codes, if you look at the Onyx code list, this case Onyx code list 28, you do have those audience codes and particularly the codes uh, 05 for tertiary education, 06 professional and scholarly, 08 adult. But from in the academic sector, 05 and 06 are going to be particularly important. <clears throat> they end up in Onyx looking like that. So 06 is, is professional and scholarly. And 05 is tertiary education. If, you, if you're classifying some of your edu uh, academic titles for tertiary education, then you probably also want to look at the qualifiers in the fours. So the four qualifiers are educational purposes. And there are things like, you can say it's, it's a textbook. Um, you might also want to say it's for, for CT, for higher tertiary university education. And you can also give uh, greater detail and say it's for undergraduate education, for postgraduate education. When you're adding these, you're saying <clears throat> principal use case for this title is education at tertiary level. Okay. Doesn't mean other people can't read it, but you're saying the primary purpose or what we're saying the primary purpose of this title is, is educational. If you use those, let's take this title. Fundamentals of wastewater treatment and engineering. So this is very much an academic title. Um, I've included a snippet of Onyx to, with, from the publisher's description. This textbook is designed for undergraduate and graduate students. So there are choices here. This book obviously can be read by anybody who's a specialist who needs to know more about wastewater treatment and engineering. You know, it's not reserved exclusively for the uh, tertiary education. So the publisher can make a, treat, a choice. They could say my primary audience, I'm going to say it's, pro, it's um, academic. So I could use the 06, that's a choice. Or 
you could say my primary audience is uh, tertiary education. That is a choice that um, publishers need to make. Now, if I'm, if I'm using this notion of audience is tertiary education, then I probably want to put in my, my qualifiers as well. So subjects always remain the same, but I can add in those um, <clears throat> educational qualifiers to give further indication that this is for general uh, tertiary education. Okay, and that's it from me. And I shall hand back to Karina. Uh, yes, not just yet. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. I do apologise for my coughing, everyone. I have had COVID over Christmas and New Year, so I do apologise if I keep coughing. Um, yes, thanks for that, um, Chris. I just wanted to ask you, actually, before you go, or uh, uh, is there a <laughs> is there anything in the HEMA about um, qualifications uh, curriculum that 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 type of thing? Yes. So within the national extensions, um, there's a whole area. It's the they all start with four Z. Um, so we have pure broad generic ones like the ones I've just shown you for um, tertiary education and then under 4Z we have various ones but for the United Kingdom there's a whole set of subcodes they deal with the standard national curriculum for primary and secondary education um, but then also we have vocational and professional so based on the approach of the four nations depending how they do it there are codes for vocational education in Scotland uh, professional education in Wales um, so there are various qualifiers that can be used and the purpose of a particular book is more aimed at a specialist market like that. And and that would that would obviously I guess would be true um of other countries around the world as well. Each, yes. each country would have its own um different criteria. Each country that submitted because the the four Z um when there's we get any details, they only come from um, the users in that country who got together and said this is how we need to express it because different countries have different needs. Um, the nearest we get is um, we might put in a qualified descent for the educational curricula of a country but yeah. not having any detail so we can flag a title that is for that curricula but we leave the detail to the right. country. So for example if I wanted to add we could say we need to flag that it's for the education curricula of Botswana but I wouldn't, I, we, it would be for people who can use it in Botswana to actually tell us what they need, as an example. Right, got you. Okay, okay. And if the, if the curriculum need, if the, the change, if, if, if the requirements of those curricula change, is that, theme or is sort of future proof for that? Is it, or would that require subsequent So changes? for example, the UK is a good example. So <clears throat> with the um, Scotland, change the names of a couple of the exams so we have qualifiers for those specific exams um, and but then we also added in the new qualifiers for the new exams so you can flag them so sometimes the name changes but mostly as the the generic codes they work um, or through through name changes okay. and approaches or for example the new T levels that um, were added, so there's a, there was a theme of qualifier added for the T levels, so that's something that's gradually being rolled out. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you to hand over the screen while I introduce her. Hand over the screen to Fiona, if that's okay. So Hi. while you're doing that, I will I will talk. Um, <laughs> so. I am going to invite uh, next up Fiona Green um, to take the virtual stage. And Fiona is senior metadata manager at Bloomsbury Publishing, academic and professional. And today she's going to give us a behind the scenes look at um, Bloomsbury's thema implementation process, focusing primarily on, on her division, academic and professional. Practical tips on how to best go about it. And we'll get insights into their approach and, and equally importantly their ongoing management of, of subject classification um so i'm going to disappear now fiona if you're all set thank you um and hand over to you thank you very much thank you can everyone see my slides okay yes can see them great okay Perfect. 
Um, yeah, so hello, my name is Fiona Green and I'm the Senior Metadata Manager for the Academic and Professional Division of Bloomsbury Publishing. Um, so we implemented the usage of Thema codes in the division in March 2021. And I'll be giving a brief overview of the implementation process, the ongoing management of classification coding in the AMP division and future projects we'll be working on um, as well. Um, so just to give a bit of background, Bloomsby is often associated with Harry Potter, but it also has a large and expanding academic and professional division. Um, significant growth has been achieved both organically and through numerous acquisitions such as ANC Black, Method in Drama, Continuum, Oberon Books, Zed, um, Red Globe Press and most recently ABC Clio. Uh, there's an editorial team of about um, 70 editorial staff commissioning in over 40 subject areas and specialise in arts, humanities and social sciences, law, business and management and study skills. And we publish a, a really wide range of product types as well. So monographs, supplementary texts, textbooks, reference, major reference, practitioner, academic generals and plays. And then as well as the publishing print and ebooks, and the division also for digital resources, um, providing online research and learning environments. So platforms include Bloomsby Collections, Drama Online, Bloomsby Fashion Central, Screen Studies and Study Skills. So I hope this gives an indication of the sort of wide and varied subjects and product types published by the division. Um, so in terms of the metadata team for the AMP division at Bloomsby, there's myself plus one metadata executive. And we have responsibility for championing the quality, discoverability, timeliness and effectiveness of bibliographic data across the print and ebooks aspects of the division. There's also a separate metadata team for the digital resources, but they also use many of the metadata fields managed by us. Um, so we've met so many products and subject areas, a decentralized approach is taken to metadata. Um, so editors are responsible for copy and classification coding, but this is supported by centralized checks and processes, which I'll go into more detail later. And this same decentralized approach was taken to Thema implementation. So how do we go about implementing Thema? Um, well, as Karina mentioned earlier, the first step was that um, I took was to join the Thema National Working Group. Um, it meets quarterly, it used to be in person, usually in London, but, but now is over Zoom. And I found the group provided a great introduction to the taxonomy. Um, and an excellent forum for getting together with other publishers, booksellers and industry specialists. It's also a very neat way to delve into the taxonomy and contribute to the development and ongoing improvement of Thema. And really it gave me that in-depth knowledge to then be confident to explain the taxonomy and implement usage at Bloomsbury. There's also some great introductory resources and worked examples on the editor website. Um, so I recommend you taking a look at those um, if you haven't already. Um, it's, a, it's a very quick way of, of getting that overview. So once we were ready to roll out Thema, um, I called on the expertise of um, Chris and um, we held a half day training session for the super users of Biblio, the bibliographic database we use. So it was based on the external Thema Essentials training course but I worked with Chris to include additional Bloomsbury specific examples and context to the training. And the super user structure at Bloomsbury meant that each division within AMP has a Biblio super user. And by giving them this in-depth training, they would be able to then give the initial support for editors and marketers after the wider training had taken place. So the wider training was led by me and took the form of a one hour in-house presentation over Zoom. It was mandatory for all editorial and marketing staff and new starters still watch the recording as part of their induction. So there's been an ongoing benefit to putting that initial work in. And in that so session, I focused on the following. So first of all, I asked the attendees where they would like to think about how they'd like their title to appear in a bookshop. So they tried to place Thema in a physical setting sort of to help the editors and marketers visualize how they should use the taxonomy. Uh, we then looked at post coordination in detail and how this has been expanded since BIC and how to use it creatively. So the power of the qualifiers was emphasised and um, we looked at each qualifier separately and I included worked examples of, of how to use them. 
Um, also emphasise the importance of using the online browse tool and to avoid searching directly into Biblio. And I, I try and reiterate this at every opportunity internally. Um, the browse tool is really fantastic. It's the clearest way to understand the context of each code because you can see where each code fits within a subject tree. And also it's the easiest way to peruse the fantastic notes and cinnamon search, synonym search. Um, we then looked at Chris's six golden rules. Um, I won't go in detail here as Chris has already mentioned to them, but I have included a list of them on the next slide. Um, they form a really useful checklist um, when applying codes. So sort of getting those concepts, um, th those, those ideas, um, clearly passing that information onto the team is really important. And then lastly, we focus on the importance of consistency with other taxonomies and copying keywords. So emphasizing the importance of not sending a mixed message to, to the market, that, that all of the, the um, as well as SEMA, but BIT, BISAC, the RACs and the keywords and copy all, all send one clear message. And then straight after the training, so from the next day, it became mandatory for editors to add SEMA codes to new titles. So they started to put the taxonomy into practice straight away and then about six months after the training um, we'd started to build up a body of titles with thema codes and biblio and so i then held about 10 subject specific workshops um, and in these went over the key points from the initial training and then reviewed actual titles together and it was really an extra opportunity to think deeply about classification coding at subject level and look at the specific nuances for each of the key lists of academic and professional. So there's just a reminder of the six golden rules, which are guidelines, so they don't have to be followed, but, but it does, does, it does give a very good checklist. Um, so as mentioned earlier, the editors are responsible for copy and classification coding, but this is supported by centralized checks and processes. So in terms of the theme implementation, we took the decision to focus on front list first. And I think this is really worth considering if you haven't adopted theme yet. It, it can be quite overwhelming thinking about closing all the backlists, but at least start moving forward with the taxonomy. Um, so theme codes are now added at record setup, so they can be reviewed at new book proposal meetings by sales and marketing. And it's mandatory to have at least one theme code on a title record before it can be confirmed in Biblio. So data can't be released externally without it having at least one theme code. And all codes are also checked by marketing colleagues ahead of feeding externally. So you're getting a second pair of eyes, eyes looking at the codes that have been allocated to each title. And then recently we've introduced a um, key title post-publication copying classification code review by marketing. So um, they look at the codes and the copy on, on Biblio and then look at it on Amazon and Blackwells and Barnes and Nobles and Waterstones and other sites to see how the codes are actually working externally. It is the current selection working for the title or do, do we need to look at, look at the coding again to get it into the right, right sections on these sites? And, and so it's really hoping that this sort of extra deeper dive with a handful of titles will also equip marketers to review all classification codes more comprehensively as they'll have that sort of real life evidence as to the importance of these codes. And then returning to the backlist, um, so we have a huge backlist and many are acquired titles, so it wasn't feasible to go through each title individually. I think that that is a um, potentially an approach for smaller publishers to consider, but when you have a massive list, it just isn't possible. So we had to consider a more holistic approach. So we're currently in the process of purchasing Thema codes from Nielsen Book Data to populate the backlist. Um, and the Thema codes for backlist um, titles at Nielsen will have either been mapped from BIC using the mapping system devised by Nielsen Book Data or assigned directly by their classifiers. So generally, um, Thema would have been mapped from BIC for older titles and assigned by the classifiers for new ones. Um, and BIC accreditation has been a driving factor as, as thema is now a mandatory field. Um, I'll also be looking to set up a programme this year to review bestsellers, series and specific types of titles to code in batches. Um, we'll also be reviewing how we can incorporate the diversity, equity and inclusion codes more comprehensively. 
Um, and then other future projects as well. Um, it is a taxonomy which requires ongoing training and support. So we'll be looking to roll out FEMA 1.5 at Bloomsbury and I'll set up a session to go through the additions and amendments relevant to the, to the division. But um, we'll also use that as an opportunity to reiterate the key elements of the taxonomy and why it's important to devote sufficient time to choosing the codes. So it'll be a general refresher as well. Um, the subject specific workshops that I mentioned earlier um, work really well. So be looking at um, other ways to support editors and marketers in, in smaller groups and sort of to continue to get for them to get um, a better understanding of the codes. And we'll also be looking to get a better understanding of how key vendors are using FEMA in practice and getting those real life um, examples and evidence to inform how, um, our guidance going forward. And it's obviously a taxonomy that doesn't stay still. So also be looking at how Bloomsbury can contribute to FEMA 1.6. Um, I work closely with the metadata teams in the adult fiction, children's and special interest divisions at Bloomsbury. So we'll work together to supply suggestions with Chris. So just in summary, um, I'd really recommend engaging with the industry ex experts. Um, if you're looking to roll out FEMA a bit, Editor and Nielsen Book Data all offer and all offer Bloomsbury fantastic support. So do get in touch with them as appropriate, them as appropriate. Um, and really just remember there's no time like the present, present, particularly with Bitco is becoming obsolete from February 24. Um, look how you can introduce Thema to meet immediate requirements for the front list. And then in terms of the back list, it can be an ongoing process. So depending on how much resource can be allocated, it's something which can be picked up in quarter periods, if they ever exist, um, and, and use that time to, to review the back list. Um, and, and it's fine to delve into a specific area, so you can sort of zone in on some of the codes and think how can we use those for our books and, and start applying them in batches across titles. And that's all from me, so thanks very much for listening. Great, thanks Fiona. <clears throat> um, interesting that you, you and I, I understand why, why you've done it, but it, the, the, it, the decentralised approach to metadata and FEMA within Bloomsbury, is that, I guess that's, um, you, you decentralise the activity, but there would be a unified approach. Yes. Um, overall. So is that, is that, um, how easy is that to to um, to manage? I guess it's an ongoing conversation. And it how is do you, ongoing. How does that happen? Yeah, how does I, that I how think, happen? Go um, on. Yeah, I mean, it is. I think we've all, um, both copy and classification codes, the responsibility of editors. And so it does vary. Some editors really get it and they devote the time to it and they understand the importance. and fit it in with their commissioning and make sure that they devote sufficient time to it. Um, and then others do need more support and training, but that's why we have the checks with the marketers as well. So there's always two yeah. people. And, um, and certainly now we've got it up and running. And once we've got those, we've imported the theme codes from Nielsen Book Data, then we can really then start to look at the backlist and to start to look at where subjects have been well coded and where other areas where we think actually I still think there needs to be a bit more training for the editors to really understand how to use it so um yes it, it I mean it, it has going back to what Chris was saying about subject specialists we are it does mean the subject specialist and the person that really understands that monograph the best <laughs> um and has that direct contact with the author they are the ones filling in the code so it's not that we're, we've got people that are removed from the subject area it, yeah. it, it's, it's getting the time devoted to it I would say is um yeah. it, it, it's, it's making sure that okay. yeah and, and I would sort of say in a way that if you do this coding if you do it right at the start spend the time when you're really involved in the book um then then also that will help sell your book while you're asleep it's the silent seller <laughs> and so do yeah. spend the time and, and those codes will work for you without any further effort that's not I like that. from the work that sales does but yeah um, but it Thema is, is the silent seller yeah we may have to use that um <laughs> and yeah brilliant and and also to your point as well using others to help going to others to help you so like using nielsen coming to bic going to editor it, it's not something that 
you know help is out there um you know if you get stuck or you, you, if there's you know there are opportunities and, and solutions that, that difficulties what would you say the most challenging uh, challenging aspect of this was of implementing thema from scratch was I think it is getting started and getting the knowledge level yourself as well and, and having confidence that you do understand the taxonomy as well as you should. I mean, there's still things I would say the education qualifiers. We've still got quite a lot of work there to get our titles up to scratch with them. Um, at the start, I focused on the subjects and the place and the time qualifiers. And then really having confidence to think, no, this is a textbook. It is aimed at first year undergraduates and therefore we code these bachelor titles exactly like that. Because it can sometimes yeah. feel like you're almost limiting, but actually you just want to explain to the market who the main who the main audience are for, for that book. Yeah. And I yeah. yeah. And I would say the other thing is understanding the other area is understanding how vendors are using this and because it's changing is keeping up to date with that as well. So that is making sure that how we're using it internally is reflecting the reality of of how the codes are used um and yeah. and when that changes um yeah okay great and i think what i really liked as well to hear was the the, the practical the practical side of things where it, it, it you're, you're showing people that you know you're, you're encouraging your, your your teams to go and check how what you put in thema translates onto the retailer platforms so i think and that's it, it that's when it, it goes from being sort of, sort of theory as it were to the practical um what it looks like yeah. in the real world so um i think that that's really encouraging probably something and it is exciting when you then change the codes like there have been ones where we it's not in the right section on amazon and we've gone back changed the codes we fed them through nielsen book data and and then you know it has resulted in that change and there's been yeah. ones that have been placed in the wrong department and then we've switched the thema code so, and you, so see. you can see the correlation and yeah it's it's quite enjoyable <laughs> 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 ah, brilliant okay well thank you very much um for, for that fiona we it's now time for uh, q a so let me just put my little screen up here uh, <laughs> There we go. You should see that. Just to just to try and encourage people to put questions in. <clears throat> so, and Chris, we've got you back. Um, I think. There we go. Yeah, I can see you. Yes, there. I'm so here. I'm, hello. <laughs> I'm just going to see if we have any questions. It looks like we might have a few. So, um, so we've got. Okay, we've got a few. Actually, that's encouraging. Okay, so um, first one. If we're aiming for three to four thema codes per book, do qualifiers count as codes or are they just used to give further information about the other codes selected? Shall I answer <clears throat> that one? Um, yes, quick, quick. That's a very, very good question. So the guidelines about the number of subject codes um, is good, but <clears throat> I also say add qualifiers and then apply the same rules to qualifiers so when you're looking at qualifiers we we say a guideline same guideline think about <clears throat> three or four qualifiers maximum so to not overdo it but that same question raised a good point when you're adding a qualifier qualifier applies to has to apply to all the subjects you, there's no there's no vocabulary in in thema to say this qualifier only applies to this so for example in the when I was showing the example of the regional studies, I had French studies, the code for the Francophonie plus the code for French. Both those qualifiers applied to the GTM code. So think of when you're looking at your subject codes and then you're looking at your qualifiers, apply the same principles to the qualifiers. Let's try not to exceed the, the, the four. There are exceptions, education. You may have something that is suitable for multiple curriculum. You know, it's suitable for the curriculum of Northern Ireland, Wales, England, and Scotland, and you want to make those distinctions. So you may need multiple codes because of the complexity of the education system, etc. But yes, that was a very good question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, could someone say a bit more about considering equality and di uh, diversity when choosing FEMA codes? So I'm going to go to you again, Chris. We do have a, a big brunch recording on all of that. So I don't know if you wanted to say anything else. 
to so that? In, in within the context of academic, so as as Karina said, there is a there was a big um, branch done on the subject. We have uh, documents on the editor website about um, DEI and Thema and DEI and Onyx. Even academic, for example, things like accessibility are incredibly impo important. Looking at making sure that your academic content is ex accessible to 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 the widest variety, widest audience possible, without restricting the people. Uh, so that aspect of DEI is incredibly important. But within Thema, there are various codes in the qualifiers, the five qualifiers that allow you to call out subject matter that deals with marginalized groups etc um the it is something that uh we do keep a close eye, eye on in the standards bodies um and we try and make sure there's ways of doing it there are limitations in so you can express subject matter it's harder to express uh detailed codes about somebody's personal identity because it's personal you, the most you can do is um, a consensual biography. So work with your researchers, your academics that have written and said, this is how I'd like myself to be presented in the biography. So it's very, it's, we can create subject codes, we can create qualifiers about content, about the approach of a subject, harder when we're looking at the, the actual people that create things. So yeah, also there's a lot of work, as I said, done on accessibility and we have documents. Uh, there are other organizations that also have a lot of information about accessibility and that kind of metadata. I don't know if Fiona has got something she'd like to add. Um, well, it is one of, of the projects on my to-do list, but to see how we can use Thema in terms of putting together thematic um, groups of titles around D and I. So um, I, the starting point is your presentation, Chris, and the documentation. And, um, <coughs> Yeah, so, I, so we haven't done a lot on it yet, but I do think there are a lot of codes there that, that we will be able to put to good use. Yeah, and, and, and just I should say as well um, that the BIC subject classification scheme doesn't handle diversity, equity, inclusion very well at all, um, which is another reason to um, to be using Thema and then to be moving across to using Thema. So also um, having said that, that the BIC codes don't, handled that very well anymore they're out of date i think they're over 10 years old um so um they're not going to be updated either um which is another reason to to go to thema and, and migrate um your, your your classifications over to, to thema um in place of bic can I'm i just, like, put that echo echo a point with that um that's a very good point um Thema is, is very much an organic, it's very much a living uh, system. So as, as it's uh, designed to meet the needs of the global book supply chain, so for example, Shona's at Bloomsbury, they're going to be working on the DEI and looking at that. There may be things that come out of that that will feed back in to Thema that may then get added to a future version. So I'd always say to people, as you're looking at things, if there are things you think should be able to express in Thema, then get in touch. I think one note on that, one thing I did notice is there's not a synonym for global majority. And that's something that I was going to get in touch with you, Chris. You know, I think there's the small, so, so it doesn't have to necessarily be new codes. It can be as well that the, the, the getting well, those notes and synonyms updated yeah. with yep. with the terminology that we that um, that we use in house is one of the aspects that we look at. Yeah. Okay. Great, but do have a look at the um, the big theme of brunch on on this very topic um, as a really good place to start. So, um, next question: uh, Should we remove the big snippets from our Onyx three records from February twenty four onwards? No. Okay, that's an easy one. Do you want an explanation? <laughs> um, if you've yes, done the work, if you've done the work, leave them yeah. there. There's, so they're being made obsolete. They're, they're no longer they're, they're they're not being supported in the sense that there'll be no documentation, there'll be no training, but they still exist. And there may be um, systems that still need them for a bit, or people want to use them. So if they're there, leave them. It does no yeah. harm if you don't. If you receive Onyx and you don't need that bit of data, you ignore it. 
It doesn't make your index invalid or anything. Yeah. You just ignore it. And it's creating extra work for your team. Yeah. Someone's got to go in and take that data out where you'd be, your time would be much better spent putting the theme codes in rather than taking yeah. the bit codes out. <clears throat> Now, if you're in a process of updating all your metadata and you want to do a bit of house cleaning and you want to remove everything on mass, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But there's no obligation to remove it. it we, it's, they're being made obsolete, but they, they will not make your Onyx invalid. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. Good question. Um, next question. I love it. We're getting loads of questions today. Um, is it worth doubling up on overlapping areas? For example, if something is suitable for higher or advanced higher, should we also code it as being suitable for A level? I don't know who wants to take that one. Fiona? Yes, I would. So I suppose the example that springs to mind for Bloomsbury is our plays where some of them will be aimed at A level but also work at undergraduate level. So you would potentially then code those plays. But it would have to be, you have to be very confident, I suppose, in knowing that both of those markets, it's important. Um, it works for. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> the, the doubling up is it's always a good question. Um, you, what you're doing in your metadata is talking about this is the primary audience, this is who it's mostly, you're not restricting it, I mean, anybody can, can use it, but if it is also suitable for A-level, it's good to indicate that. So sometimes if you're, for example, if you're using a code saying this is suitable for the England England's A-levels or Wales's um, A-levels, and also for undergraduate, you probably want something in the text that makes it clear why you're saying that. Don't just use the codes, that gives people also an, in, some information about that series of plays, why it's suitable for use in both, because there is a big, there are mm -hmm. overlaps, especially that sort of 16 um, to early 20s in uh, higher education. And, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, question for Fiona, can you expand a little on the mapping done by Nielsen Book Data for Bloomsbury's backlist titles? Um, we won't be able to go into the commercials of that arrangement, but if you uh, could okay. just give a bit I, I think if you what it is. Um, yes, they, they are happy um, to provide. Um, to, but you, you can purchase the theme codes that they've allocated. So is that um, so, so I would just get in touch with your contact at Nielsen Book Data and start a discussion. I mean, it it, it, it certainly. It's a good way, of, I think, of starting the backlist to just just get the populate to get the titles populated. And we've not only just done it with our backlist, but also with our most recent acquisition because it's a US-based publisher. They didn't have theme or bit codes, so it's something right. to consider if you've got to do mass updating um, as a starting point. But get in touch with Nielsen, and I'd be happy to explain. <laughs> Those mappings are available. Nielsen um, have do oh. Nielsen. I did those the mappings from the two schemes, so to and from from the big subject codes to Thema and from Thema back to them. So Nielsen have made them publicly available. They're available on the editor website. So they are, and that just tells you how to do a mapping, and you can give it to somebody who can create a program to do that automatically, or you can use it manually. So th there is a there is a general one available for everybody. If you need individual, if you actually need your backlist, that's a conversation with Nielsen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question for Fiona. Um, you mentioned searching on Biblio for codes versus using the online code lists. We're migrating to Biblio this year, and I'm curious uh, about how new theme codes are imported to Biblio as they're updated and revised. Are these updated automatically or do we need to import them? There, well, we're, it, it, you speak to Virtue Sales about it and they will update them. So you decide, it, it goes in with a, another update that's been organised by business systems yeah. for the business. So you agree a time scale for it. And, I, and that's, um, my understanding of that is that an individual publisher basis arrangement um, um yeah so I, I would speak to the contact at virtue sales and then they will they will do the update um usually with other updates on the biblio system yeah. at the same time 
they'll be aware of them as well because they sit on the BIC yeah. UK, Onyx, uh, UK SEMA and Onyx national group so they, they will be aware of those those changes as well so and, and it, you, won't be, it won't be news to them when you No, when and you they are ready to, to load 1.5 so we're just in the process yeah. of, of doing that so they are up to date on their own systems and then it's a, it's a discretion as to when to switch over. Yeah. And I would I say just... I would say the same for any um, system provider as well, not not just Biblio. Um, so uh, yeah, if anyone else is using other other systems, do have those conversations with your providers. <clears throat> and also because um, no no all the all the codes I'm in the world, but there's no deleted codes at the moment for Thema. So the good news is you're only adding and training on adding. You don't unlike BISAC because of the the differences in the process which if the codes are no longer being used and you may have to recode titles at the moment with theme is just building new codes <clears throat> yes i'd just like to emphasize that all versions of theme are backward compatible as the hierarchical right. um <clears throat> you can if if, it, if somebody's using a new code you can take it back up one level to the previous code if need be so everybody is aware <clears throat> so all the the different systems providers are, are made aware of the, the processes and are aware of the new codes and when we do a new iteration when we add codes it's an ongoing process it starts with us having discussions with our working groups and there's a proposal then we'll launch it and from that launch there's a whole implementation but there's no obligation to recode you all the all the old codes are still perfectly valid so everything that was valid in 1.4 is still there in 1.5 we've just added a few new codes and maybe added some modifications to notes for clarity purposes so sometimes it's good which is probably some part of the process that bloomsbury is going through they'll look at the 1.5 codes that have been added and say actually that one would be really useful if we started using that let's go back and look at some of the titles that could use that but there's no obligation to do it so it's a gradual process Thank you. I think that answers, I'm pretty sure that answers the next question. <clears throat> Will a code from a previous Thema version always exist in a new or future version? I understand that the notes around a code may get updated, but I think we've already answered that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> when, we, when, we update an, when we update a code, it's just about clarity because oh. it's an international scheme and, <clears throat> you know, we might express something and then somebody in Japan might say, actually, what do you mean by this? So we'll look at it and say, actually, yeah it's not clear enough or there's a concept from the academic somebody sector somebody might say oh we're looking for books on this concept so <clears throat> after a bit of research i say oh actually this this is actually part of this branch but um, it's just a new way of expressing it so we need to add a note to make it clear if somebody's looking where to classify those books doesn't change yeah. the meaning of existing codes if if ever we were going to do that that would become thema 2 but that's you know, there's no plans for a next a new version like a theme or two or anything like that yet. yeah okay we seem to have lost fiona i don't know if that was intentional if she knows we've lost her or um or just her camera gone i think maybe just a camera okay so we'll, we'll just hopefully she'll she'll join us um soon so I've, we've got a little bit of time i've got a few questions i've not about very many um and just to give people time to to think if they want to add anything any other questions to the question box? Um, Chris, you say, um, I know I, I've asked you this question before, but just for the, the, the benefit of, of the people on the call that may not know, um, you mentioned that Thema is a scheme created and maintained by the people who use it. Could you tell us a bit more about the governance of Thema and, and how, if, if somebody on this call wants to make a suggestion for a new code or, or area or concept, how did they go about that? Yeah. So Thema, like um, editors, other standards, Onyx and Editex, they're all maintained by the users. So there's a structure. Um, we have uh, national groups or linguistic groups of interested people. Now for the UK, that's facilitated by BIC, um, who organise uh, a UK Thema interest group, and that brings together uh, interested parties from the UK, so from publishing, from retail, from systems <laughs> providers who will look at the questions. That's a group that will take in consideration uh, needs for new codes or updates for the 
from the UK book market. So they may, that's a group, one group to get in touch with, get in touch with BIC, say, all right, this is a suggestion. Or you can get in touch directly with the editor. And so we add those to a, a, <clears throat> a box of things. We will look at what that request is. We may come back to you and say, well, can you give me some examples of books that would use it? Um, can you explain it? And then those suggestions go into um, proposals, draft proposals that would then go to all the different national groups who then think they talk about them, come back to us with feedback, um, saying, no, no, this is not needed. This is actually already covered by this. Or yeah, that's a really good idea. It's really important for our market. Um, they do all that. Then we create a working group that looks in fine detail at all proposals. And then eventually they put together a draft proposal that goes back to all the national groups. If they agree to it, it's then validated. I know that sounds complex, but it's so that our codes remain relevant to everybody. They've got to be there. They've got to be things that people actually want for the book industry. You know, yeah. and they're not got to be things that <clears throat> I suddenly sit in the office and go, oh, wouldn't it be good if we had a code on this? No, it's got to be, um, it's, it, it works because it comes from publishers, it comes from data provide, uh, aggregators, it comes from retailers, it comes from people who are using it and see real life cases for it. Yeah. And also because it's international, you get that feedback from all over the globe and from different types of organizations. So that could be a huge um, book, book chain or online retailer, or it could be a small academic publisher, etc. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got another question that's just come in. Is there any prospect of extending theme codes to journals? Um, <clears throat> the, the, a good question there's nothing that stops you using existing theme codes for journals um especially if you're classifying monographs you know if you're classifying journals on on um on, you know in a in a broad category so you're just looking for your sociology journals or sociology of immigration journals yes it, it works um the the thing would be is if you're if you're creating metadata about journals the people that you're exchanging that metadata with, are they using it? Right. That kind of thing. But there's, we don't, there's nothing that stops it. It's not specifically conceived for journals, but it also works because it works for academic books, monographs. Um, journals might also, if we're if starting to look at it for journals, that, that might also raise some questions about some of the areas, in, especially in academic, where we may be weaker. Um, but I think if you even if you're looking at um, like library classification of journals, they're often put in the broader category. So yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, no other questions coming in at the moment. Just I'll I'll put one out there then. And I think actually Fiona, you've already addressed this anyway in your presentation. But um, can you change the codes later on if you want to say refine refine something or uh, change something or you've made a mistake or you just want to try a different approach how easy is it to do that should you do that um yes with the caveat that particularly for nielsen book data you do need to let them know if you've done mass changes because their classifiers are working on a lot of thema codes at the moment those updates don't necessarily automatically go on to the vendors that nielsen book data are supplying so their preference is that you do the updates and then make them aware. So, yeah. yeah, but I do think it's worth it because I think also when you're learning, I, I know in the process of the, the last couple of years, there will be a few where I may have made some decisions. One thing again is with the um, subject code, um, education subject codes, that it's fine to apply the, um, the children ones for books aimed at teachers. And that's something that wasn't necessarily in my initial training. So I'm going back and working with the education editors to make sure that we've included them. So I think as you get to know the taxonomy better, you might think, actually, I, I do want to do that slightly differently than, yeah. than I did initially. But just try and do it in batches if you can. Uh, and I would say that there's nothing in a standard like Onyx, for example, that st stops you doing that. There's nothing in FEMA that stops you doing an update. In fact, no, Onyx, yeah. Onyx is designed to be able to send those updates, 
but you do have to have conversations with people because so some people won't update after you know they will use the initial code and they will stick to that so that, that there are the realities of the supply chain but of course you can use it and also when a new code gets added that you think actually no this is a really good code i need to update it so huh. i think what Karen said about communication and conversations is important um, yeah. make sure for example if you've got an ongoing relationship with, with a, a big data receiver say look periodically we're going to update the subject code do you accept updates to subject codes uh, don't worry we're not going to change every week um we're not you know we're not changing all the time but if we do change will you accept it if they say no we'll stick to the first then that's up to you to, to talk to them but there's nothing yeah. that stops you doing it yeah okay um and then i've got one more question um just sort of i'm putting myself into the position of somebody who's completely new to fema um and they, they want to get started um chris when you were talking you mentioned lots of maybes um which is which is great I, I know exactly why you've you've done that um however if someone is new to thema how could that the the, the the wealth of possibilities may may be a little bit overwhelming um how would you narrow down the maybes and 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 how could you what would you what would you say where would you start i mean you've, you've got all this sort of documentation you've got thousands of qualifiers and subject categories how where do you start if you're completely new and you're feeling a bit overwhelmed with it all, what, what would you recommend um i'd start with something that fiona said which is think about this think about your titles in a physical bookshop think about think about the experience of somebody who's actually looking for that book and that title and, and remember that's what you're doing you're basically trying to <clears throat> give clear information for somebody who may want to purchase that title stock that title in their library etc so put yourself into the 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 end readers shoes first and think about one copy on the shelf where would i put them and where would my readers find it now when you're looking at the <clears throat> The documentation, as with any standard, um, it's overwhelming. If you've got resources like Bloomsbury has a very good resources, use those resources and use existing experience. But we are editors also have things. The BIC website, when it's back up and running, has a very good series of introductions to subjects. So there's a thing called a BIC bite um, on Thema. That's a very good basic start. But think. Uh -huh. What, a, what you're thinking about if you're just starting this is this is a subject classification i am saying what shelf you should put it on that's basically what you're doing so if i was looking for a book for myself that i'm interested in you know where would i go that's th th yeah. think like that okay Shana. i'd also yeah. in, encourage um to just spend an hour on the online browser i mean this is advice i give to the editors and marketers is sit down with a nice cup of coffee, <laughs> shut everything else down and just go down the rabbit holes in the, in the browser because I think if you then, it gives you a sort of visual element to, mm. to how it's structured and and then it, particularly if you then say do pick five titles and think well how would I code these and sit there and, and search and look at the synonyms and look at the notes and, and, and familiarise yourself with it. Um, yeah, you, you, you can achieve quite a lot, probably even in 20 minutes, you, you'd get quite a good understanding of one one subject area and an overview of the yeah. qualifier. Yep, and down, have a look at the Excel or the um, HTML version when you're just seeing things like that. The, the Excel is quite good if you think, right, I've been told I've got to do the classification in the law section. Let me have a look at all the law codes as well, because you can just look through yeah. them, see all their notes, and then gradually start looking at our documents we try and do with editor we try and do a lot of help uh, we try and do them in simple blocks and we're bringing out new documents all the time trying to do it in little chunks and not to overwhelm people we'll be bringing out a video in the next couple of months as a basic introduction to theme that will be a 10 minute video you know to help people with these first questions um bringing out a document on how many how many codes you should use how you should mix codes you know those kind of things and also we have worked examples which are just giving people possible ways of using those even if they're not in your area so that's 
because there are different things to show the possibility. Oh. And don't don't let it overwhelm you because it's yeah. it's just and there's a lot there, but it's actually it's just choosing the right starting. Subject. Mm -hmm. it's just and starting. Thing, the theme of essentials course as well. Um, I mean, um, we we, did, we we had a an in house version for for Bloomsby, but there is there is the general one as well, which is a good introduction. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Thank you. I think we're we're getting on for almost running out of time. So um, what I will do is I'll just do a, a quick sum up, if I may. So um, let me just move the slide on. So thank you to the audience. Thank you for our attendees for all the all the great questions there. Um, so. Um, brilliant session today. Really enjoyed it. I hope you have. Um, we heard from uh, from Chris about Anne and Fiona about the six general rules. Um, do take a look at those. So the importance of qualifiers, national extensions, context, primary, uh, and, and the, of course the primary code. Um, we heard that the scheme, and, and a really important point to mention is that, that FEMA is a scheme created and maintained by the people that use it. To quote Chris, um, <clears throat> it's also multilingual and global. Um, and that might, may sound obvious to, to, to Chris and Fiona, but some people on the call may not be aware of that. Um, and we, we looked at regional studies with Chris's um, presentation, we looked at the G section, the importance of language, place qualifiers. Um, we also had a, a little dive into sociology um, and uh, how to address that hugely diverse um, concept or subject area. Um, and also heard from Chris about, you know, the best people to classify the books um, are those that know the content the best. And also to bear in mind when you're classifying, who is the content for, who do you who do you want to find it? Um, and how, how you, just sort of putting yourself into the position of, of that, the end reader or the end user, make make their discovery journey as easy as possible. Um, we heard also about the importance of audience and treatment and educational purpose. Um, and from, from Fiona, we heard about uh, theme awareness as a part of uh, an ongoing induction program for new starters, which I think is really important to just keep that, make sure you capture everyone, every new starter that's coming into your organization, get them sort of informed and, and up to speed with, with regards to what theme is. They may not need to go into it in, in every level of detail that perhaps you're bibliographic data experts would, but I think having that general awareness is really important. Um, and then just sort of reiterating that throughout your organization um, for, for not just the new starters, but for, for everybody on, the, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, I think as well, what I'm hearing is, especially from Fiona, is just start. Um, it may feel overwhelming, um, but perhaps start with a particular section, maybe a, a book. Uh, type or a, a book area, maybe front list, maybe a subject area, maybe, um, you know, it's up to you really how you want to divide it up. But by sort of dividing your catalogue into um, chunks, it becomes e even more easily manageable and, and less daunting. Uh, and maybe think about prioritising your front list and then revisiting your, your back list later. Um, what I really like from Fiona was the importance of looking at theme in action so going to those going to the retailer platforms having a look and seeing you know it, 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 how thema is informing where the booksellers are displaying their books um, and again this all ties into the the user journey or the the the, the potential readers um discoverability journey um and then just a reminder to say um, that bitcodes, if, if you haven't already picked it up, bitcodes are going to be made obsolete from February 2024. So please do, please do start looking at the theme now. It's it's a really good time to start. Don't don't leave it till sort of January 24 or December this year. This is a lot to do. Um, so on that note, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, but it brings us to the end of, of our session today. Uh, we'll send the presentation, uh, the, the slideshow round to everybody um, after this event. And like I said at the start of the session, that will probably be next week at some point. Um, and the recording of the webinar as well, we'll send you a link to that too. Um, once we have our new website up and running, which should be around <coughs> middle of Feb, sorry, end of January, um, You'll have the recording and the slides and everything will be on the website anyway. Um, so if you prefer to access it in that way, please do. Um, if you want to stay up to date with the work that we do at BIC and our events, um, 
sign up to our mailing list it's on the screen there um, which will be in your slides so you can go in um, but in the meantime I'd like to point you to two very important and helpful documents on Thema so two big bites big bites number 14 and 15 14 is a general intro to Thema um, and although our website currently has a landing page or a holding page I, I should say we do actually have the big bites on there so you can just click on to a little category of called big bites and you'll have all the big bites there at your fingertips so do go and have a look download them print them out whatever you want to do with them um, and big bite number 15 uh, is an introduction to thema for booksellers um, so they're free freely available you don't have to be a big member go and help yourself um, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a massive thank you to our speakers on behalf of BIC and everyone here today, everyone in attendance. So thank you, Chris and Fiona, for taking the time out to um, not only talk to us today, but do all the preparation, do all the, um, the rehearsals, technical run throughs, um, etc. Because I, I know that, that takes time. And to you, our attendees, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today. I hope you found it helpful, informative, etc. Um, and please do stay in touch. Again, ordinarily, you'd be able to go onto our website and find out more about us, but um, sign up to our mailing list for now while, while we're building our website um, and you, you'll be able to, to keep up to date with everything we're doing. That means you'll also get the, the press release that's coming out um, next month as well with updates on, on Thema migration and um, a really useful set of FAQs. Um, that's it. So um, hope to see you at another BIC event in the near future. Uh, take care until then. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> Thank you, Karina. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Sorry, I went on. Um, my whole computer crashed. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. I it's fine. I, thought I, put, I just thought it's probably not worth oh. it. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Karina, the just. We're, we're still recording, by the way. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. We're saying goodbye. <laughs> no, I bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Send you something, bye. but I don't. Oh. Yeah, I'll talk to you later, Chris. Okay. Yep. Bye, everyone.